Good morning and welcome to Wells Church. What a blessing it is to have you join us today as we worship virtually and as we share in God's love, as we together seek the God who is already seeking us and seeking to live in relationship with us. We are certainly glad that you are joining us. We invite you to, to share this, to invite your friends to join you as we worship together each Sunday at 1030. And we continue to long for that day and for we can gather back together. But for now, we're doing our part by continuing to social distance and wear our mask and certainly continue to, to try to do what we can to stop the spread of COVID-19. Well, I invite you also to kind of watch our Friday emails because as soon as weather permits, we are going to try to go back outside and have our worship services there and want you to be able to join us that. I do want to let you know of a couple of experiences. Ash Wednesday and Lent is coming up. And so I want you to know that there are plans in place for us to do some uh, acts of worship uh, as we share together on those days. On Ash Wednesday, February 17th, I'm going to meet whoever would like to come and drive through uh, for the imposition of ashes in a unique and different way this year uh, as we come here to the church and from 7 a.m. to 8.30 a.m. and again from 5 p.m. to 6.15 p.m. We also are going to share together in a virtual service. Uh, Aldersgate United Methodist Church and Reverend John L. Henry and I are going to help lead that at 7 p.m. on February 17th. So we will be holding our joint Ash Wednesday service together. This year will just be virtual here on Facebook Live as well as on our website and on the, the means that uh, Aldersgate shares theirs as well. So we invite you to prepare to join us on Ash Wednesday for those occasions. We will be sharing at the end of the service in Holy Communion, and so if you want to join me in that, I invite you to prepare yourself to do so as we share together. We continue our Zoom meetings, Coffee with Chris, 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday mornings. You're welcome to join us for that, and also our prayer meeting on Wednesday evening at 6 via Zoom as well. Those links are always in our emails that we share, and so invite you to join us for that. We're also working on Lenten devotion booklets that we hope will be ready and available on Ash Wednesday. We certainly will be doing those um, as we have digitally by email and other correspondence. And then we also will have some printed copies if you would like those. You can either come by in the line on Ash Wednesday and receive one there or you can uh, let us know and we'll be sure to try to get that to you. Um, we celebrate around here uh, all that God is doing in our midst, even in the midst of trying times. And so today we want to celebrate birthdays and anniversaries and anniversaries of sobriety dates and other things that you want us to celebrate with you. I invite you to type those in as you're sharing together. I will share with you that I know that today Glenda Ferguson has a birthday. And this week, Mary Hurd, May Francis Thompson, Jeff Parker, Gwen McGowan. Kit Fields and Bill Spencer all have birthdays this week. I know you're adding in others that we will share together, so we celebrate with all of you. As far as anniversaries are concerned, Renee and Roscoe Green and Ken and John Simon are celebrating anniversaries before the end of the week. And so we give thanks for that and we celebrate with them. We pray God's blessings upon their continuing journey in life together. And may God be with them, give them strength and hope and many more years living together faithfully. I am so glad that you are here and have joined us for worship today. As we journey together as a church, we seek to remember who it is that we are and how it is we seek to live together and what it is we believe. And so we affirm our faith together. Uh, we do that often through the Apostles' Creed, but also through the statement of faith of the United Church of Canada. We invite you to stand where you are as you're able and join us as with today we affirm our faith with the statement of the faith of the United Church of Canada. Join me as you can. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, 
who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Well, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And we pray that you'll share that peace of Christ wherever you go this week, that others may know the peace that comes from Jesus. You may be seated. Amen. What a joy it is to share in some of the great hymns of our faith and to share life together. Well, as we share life together today, we lift not only our affirmations, but also our, our prayer concerns and needs to God. And so I know that there are those that you'll want to add in as we share together today, but there is a list I want to share of those that have been shared with us this week and, and before that uh, need our prayers. Uh, I want to pray today for the family of Mary Spencer. That's our friend Eddie Spencer's, Reverend Eddie Spencer's mom who passed away this week in Texas. And we pray for Eddie and for his family and for the family of Miss Mary. We pray for a niece Porter and the family there. That was Ch Uncle Charlie's first cousin who passed away. We pray for the family of Jane Beach, a friend of Peggy Jennings. We pray for the family of Professor Atef Albador. We pray for the family of Dr. Jerry Witt. Two of our, our friends who had strong ties uh, with Tougaloo and with Millsaps College who also had great ties with friends here at Wells. We pray for these families and we continue to lift them up as we journey through this time together. May God give strength and grace. May God bring his presence to bring comfort and peace. We continue to pray also for John Garner, who uh, made a visit to the hospital last night and is there for a brief time. Pray for John and lift him up and Marguerite as well as we pray together 
We pray for Lorraine Buchanan, who has a procedure coming up, and for uh, her sister. We pray for David, a friend of Jamie Ward's, headed to MD Anderson for a diagnosis and treatment plan. We pray for Sarah Ward, who's in the hospital. For Nancy Offer, continued prayers. For Dick Barnes, for Pam Spell, for Alinda Ponder, for Margie Prime, for Bobby Burdine, for David Moody, for Joanne Hartley and Kirk, for Mildred Ferguson, for Rich and Jackie McGinnis. Rich has been in the hospital and now is doing a little rehab in the rehab center, but we pray for, for Rich and Jackie this week especially. For Elizabeth Harrison, for Ray Lee, for Kit Fields, for Pam Bowen, for Elvin Bobinger, for Willadina Coleman, for Alan Trotter, for Dottie Porter, for Joel Gray, for Gwendolyn McGowan, for Katie and Courtney, and for the Donald family, for Rosemary Luckett, for Trina and Bruce Reynolds, for Kit Kinsey and his continuing rehab, for Jesse Barbie continuing treatments, and for Martha Odom. And we continue to pray for God's presence to guide us as his people, to help us live out his call on our lives as we seek to be people who share the love, grace, and peace that only Christ can bring. We continue to pray for our nation, its leaders, for those involved in this fight of COVID-19, especially healthcare workers and hospital staff, administrators and doctors and all of those who continue to be frontline in that way. And we continue to pray for patients that, that healing will come. And we pray for God to be with us, to lead us, to strengthen us each step of our way. May we know God's grace. Well. I invite you to join me as we share together in prayers, not only for these I've mentioned and those that you have typed in, but also for those that we lift in silence on our heart, knowing that God hears and that God is with us and that God responds. Will you join me as we pray together? Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our anchor in the stormy blast, in our eternal home. We give you thanks, O oh God, that you're ever present with us. Even in the moments where we are uncertain of where you may be and how you may be at work in our lives, we know deep down that it's your presence that sustains us each moment, each day of our lives. God, we cry out. <laughs> for your presence to come in the midst of our world in these times. To, Lord, miraculously touch the world in this pandemic and yet miraculously speak into each of our lives as to how we can be your hands and feet and how we may contribute to turning the tide on this illness that takes so many. And help us, O oh God, to know how to be faithful. To be faithful to not only seek to change our world, but to be faithful to care for ourselves and our own souls in the midst of this journey that so easily would pull us away from you because we can't not gathering together. But yet, God, in these moments, your presence is real. And your strength comes to undergird and guide. Most of all, God, we pray that you will help us see hope and live out that hope in our world. We pray for healing and strength and for your touch upon all those that we lay before you this day, O oh God. May your presence come to touch lives and to bring strength and healing. Oh, God, continue to walk with us as we seek you in new ways and as we learn more about ourselves, about you, and about how your love sustains us. We thank you that you are here with us. And we pray for your presence to guide us this week. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Lord, our Savior, the one who taught us to pray as we now say together, our Father who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. You'll note today that one of the aspects we learn about Jesus that uh, started even last week is the healer, uh, the one who can bring true healing in God's name, and that comes deep within our soul. Thank you, David and Jamie, for that and for sharing your wonderful gifts with us each week. Uh, as they become quite the um, the musicians that lead us incredibly. I'm not sure. Hampton thought when he came on board that was going to be his role and function, but who knew, you know? Uh, but what a blessing uh, they all are. And we give thanks for our staff and for all of those who contribute so wonderfully to us. Well, we've been journeying through Mark's gospel during the season of Epiphany, and we're still in chapter 1, uh, which is a wonderful thing because a lot happens in Mark's gospel quickly and within a small scope of writing that we needed to, to share with and to see. And we've learned what, who Jesus really is and how God has been made known to us in Jesus Christ. That's the whole impetus of this season of Epiphany is to learn who God is, how God is made manifest to us in the person of Jesus Christ as he came to this earth. And so today we continue in another journey there as we look at Mark chapter 1, verses 29 
through 39. Uh, of course, as always, with a gospel lesson, I invite you to stand as you're able uh, to share together as we read this, this gospel lesson uh, from Mark's gospel. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sundown they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place. And there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let's go on to the neighboring towns so that I may proclaim the message there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. Well, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated and continue to join with me. Well, rhythms of Jesus' life and ministry is what we're already catching on to in Mark's gospel. Reminders that Mark is straight into the point. Jesus is a man of action, the very Son of God, and everything happens immediately. And it's straight into the point. Another theme, a couple more themes we get introduced today, which I'll share in, in just a moment, uh, that we learn about Mark's gospel that will carry us as we continue in Mark's gospel and be good to just note. But here we have another episode in the day and life of Jesus. And in the midst of that, we learn more. Actually, there are several episodes that appear in these ten verses that we share with together. Jesus um, has just been teaching in the synagogue. You recall last week, we talked about him casting out a demon and the demons knowing who he was. What do you have to do with me, son of God? And Jesus quieted the demon, cast him out, and then said, don't say anything. Uh, it then says that Jesus is, uh, began to be noticed, and they noticed Jesus' ministry throughout Galilee. He became well known for what he was doing, uh, his teaching and his casting out demons. As he left the synagogue, we're reminded here in verse 29 that Jesus went to fellowship with his disciples, Simon and Andrew, James and John, and they went to Simon's mother-in-law's house to do so. And so fellowship is an important part of sharing together. After the fellowship and healing Simon's mother-in-law who had fever, interesting to me there was no real uh, big deal about this. Jesus just went in, took her hand, she got up, and she started serving. I wonder if Jesus had an ulterior motive in this at this particular point, but I don't think I need to get into that. Uh, I'll just leave that as an aside. Uh, but I do know this, that she did get up and start serving them. Uh, and the fever was broken. Uh, and she was able to do that. But after that, more healing stories. People started coming to the door. And they were healed by Jesus. We've seen Jesus the great teacher. We've seen Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We see Jesus the great preacher proclaiming the kingdom of God is at hand. And here we see Jesus as someone who has the power of God within to heal and to cast out demons. He did it in the synagogue. He's now doing it at Simon's mother-in-law's house. The point is, is that Jesus is able to deal with all sorts of maladies and all sorts of environments in life and with all sorts of people and to bring them to a new and different place from where they are. The cities gather and the crowds began to form, looking for healing and exorcism. And Jesus, as he continues to do so, casts the demons out, but will not allow them to speak. Here, in Mark's gospel, is a key component of what carries us throughout the rest of the gospel. It's what scholars have called the secrecy motif. That here, in Mark's gospel, Jesus is proclaiming the kingdom's work. He's teaching 
He's casting out demons and he's healing. And yet when Jesus does that, as the crowds begin to gather, it seems that Jesus wants to divert the attention from himself. And he often says, don't say anything about it and move on. It's what scholars have called, keep it a secret, <laughs> the secrecy motif. Another thing that happens in here then is that Jesus moves to a deserted place so that he may pray alone. There as he is there, his disciples come and let him know that the crowds are gathering again, ready to see him do his show again and to be a part of what he's got going on. And Jesus announces that his goal is to go throughout Galilee and proclaim the good news. This is his mission. Not to gather crowds to bring healing and to cast out demons. But his ministry is to proclaim the kingdom of God. To touch as many lives as he's able to touch. Here we get a sense that Jesus' disciples haven't quite caught on yet as to what Jesus' true mission and ministry here on earth is about. And they want him to be already that great crowd gatherer, that great leader who shows forth God's signs and thousands of people come to be a part of it. And yet Jesus has no part of it. Two things in Mark's gospel that will continue throughout the gospel. Jesus often tells people not to share what he's done for them with others, the secrecy motif. And the fact that his disciples who are closest to him even though they're with him, don't seem to quite get it. <laughs> You'll see this all the way to the cross and the end. And so know that and, and put that in the back of your mind as we continue to journey uh, through this gospel of Mark. And then it ends with Jesus moving on to the next town and sharing the, the message of good news of the kingdom of God and casting out demons and moving on. Here again, Jesus is a man of action, moving on, next town, next thing to do. Stamping out ignorance and fitting God's people for the kingdom is the goal here that Jesus is about. Not to be drawn in with the crowds. I'll tell you, as living through this season of pandemic and, and wondering what God's call is on our lives and then being uh, confronted with this passage this morning where Jesus obviously is not about gathering crowds but is about sharing the witness of the gospel with everyone he possibly can seems to maybe speak to me and maybe speaks to us. Um, I miss the crowds, <laughs> even if they're small crowds. But I wonder if maybe sometimes we lose the point if we just worry about the crowds. Numbers have always been important in my life and in my ministry. Uh, I'm asked to record those every year and to look at how effective I've been by the numbers that show up. But yet, I wonder if we're not turning to see that maybe more effectively in proclaiming the gospel may be what we're doing in this moment in sharing the love of Christ throughout the world. There's nothing that takes the place of interpersonal relationships, and contact. Please don't hear me saying that this is the way. But what I'm saying is, is that Jesus wasn't about forming crowds. He was about touching lives. And the way he went about doing that is that he lived this journey between being public and being private. Between being out there preaching and healing and casting out demons and teaching to being with God privately praying about being with an inner circle in fellowship and sharing life together. I can recall growing up at Caswell Springs United Methodist Church that one of the most important things that happened during our week at Caswell Springs was not what we did in the church building, but what happened during the week as groups got together to eat dessert at night on Sunday evenings or to gather around a piano and sing and to grow together in faith and life to talk about what the preacher had said not just to talk about the preacher and to gather together to share life together and to grow in faith so maybe there's a model for us to begin to gather with friends and to talk about 
what the preacher says each week. <laughs> and not just to talk about what the preacher's done or not done, or anybody else. I don't get the sense that that's happening, by the way. To learn, to pray, to gather together, to seek God's presence in the world. To spend times in private prayer. When have you been along with God? You certainly have had ample opportunity these last months. But have you taken the time to truly share together with God privately in prayer? And to move on. To follow God's lead. To follow the example of Christ. And to instead of worrying about popularity and building notoriety in the crowds. To stay focused on the objective that we're called to do. To proclaim the very kingdom of God. To all that we can. Not only by how what we say, but how, by how we live. And by how we give ourselves to others. Well, today we're challenged to see the Jesus who is the healer. And yet the one who's got a clear sense that God's called him. To proclaim the good news to all that he possibly can. And that's what Jesus devoted his life to. What are we devoting ourselves to? And how are we living our lives? A couple of years ago, I had the privilege of meeting my friend Eddie Spencer's family. <laughs> we gathered, and some of you, I know, were there as well as we gathered to celebrate that Eddie's 30 years of faithfulness beyond prison, beyond Parchman Penitentiary, to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Eddie and I shared that together in some places and at times, and we certainly continue to share life. And so his mom's death this week reminded me of that wonderful experience to get to meet his family and to see how God had transformed. But also to celebrate how intentional for 30 years someone whose life had been spent in penitentiary because of things that they had done that they shouldn't have, and rightly so, they had served there. Was able to be transformed by the power and presence of Jesus Christ. And how they were able to faithfully continue to live that out. Well, Christ is calling. Christ is with us. And Christ will continue to help us be faithful in how we live out our journey. And so I invite you to live out that journey faithfully this day. Proclaim the kingdom of God. And share God's grace, presence, and love with those you meet. We find nourishment and strength because we know that Jesus is with us. And that Jesus has not left us alone. And we're reminded that his presence always is near as we gather around God's table. And as we share together these wonderful elements of bread and wine or pita and grape juice. <laughs> Or whatever it may be in your home this day. And we gather around. And it's not important what it is. But what's important is. The blessing that we offer over it. That on the night that Jesus gave himself up for us. He took bread and broke it. And gave it to his disciples. And said take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over. He passed around the cup. He said drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant. Poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. It's because of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ that we are able to come to God's table. No matter where we've been or what we've done, the invitation is for you. It's an open table. Because we believe that in this presence, God comes to transform. Transform our lives and encourage us to live out God's kingdom. And so we pray. Pour out your Holy Spirit, O oh God, on us as we gather and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ. That we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Through your spirit, make us one with Christ one with each other, and one in unity to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen.
body and blood of Christ for you. Go forth to proclaim the kingdom of God wherever you go. Go forth empowered by his love, his grace, his presence, his peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.